Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 311th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Growing plants that thrive in your yard is a lot easier than you think. It starts with saving your own seeds and letting them remember what they already learned. Just text SEEDS to 33444 or visit IWANTTOSAVESEEDS.COM and you'll receive our free webinar about why seeds matter, why saving them is easy, and how you can save your own. Today on our podcast, we have someone who is bringing an exotic flavor to our local food systems. We're talking with Joshua Berman Thayer about Mediterranean food forests. Joshua earned his degree in community engineering from Humboldt State University. He proudly admits he has always had his hands in the earth, especially through his extensive travels throughout the Americas, working with communities around plants and food. He worked as a WOOF volunteer on organic farms throughout Latin America and as a laborer on organic CSA farms in California. He gained even more experience while apprenticing and working in ecological landscape design, as well as doing native plant field research with renowned mentors. Joshua has become a lead designer and advocate for uniting ecology with aesthetic, creating beautiful, productive, natural systems that work with nature to foster bounty. Welcome to the show today, Joshua. Are you ready to rock? Rock and roll, Greg. Glad to be here. Sweet. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Why, sure. That's a big question. Happy to back it up a bit. I've been called to plants, particularly when I moved to California as an 18-year-old. I was blown away with the Bay Area's bounty of blossoms and food and native plants and worked on my degree, not really knowing where I was headed, but always working jobs through my degree, which took a while to finish at Humboldt State. And I was called to work at farms to work with vegetables, and then in my time off, summers and semesters off, I worked for a drought-tolerant landscape company. And that combination of working at a wet, water-intensive vegetable farm and a drought-tolerant perennial landscape company, that combo kind of fostered what I would then go on to start, which is my business, Native Sun Garden. And my focus has been the niche of drought-tolerant food forest and habitat combined. Wow. Can you unpack that a little bit? What is drought-tolerant? Let's go there. Sure. So here in California, for example, and in the Southwest, we deal with dry months, dry periods of the year. Drought tolerant would mean that it's a place that does not get year-round moisture. Mm, Okay. So that can also be known as the Mediterranean zone, several Mediterranean zones around the planet. Interestingly, they are all found on West Coast because I think of the Coriolis effect of the earth spinning, but that's not my expertise. Mediterranean places generally get summer drought, winter wet climate. So a drought tolerant plant would be some plant from one of those parts of the world most likely that evolved to be in cahoots with that rhythm and has strategies to live through the dry month. Wow. So you just taught me something I didn't know, and that's that Mediterranean climates are on West Coasts. That makes sense when you think about it. Yeah. Here in California is one big region considered a Mediterranean climate. Obviously, the Mediterranean basin itself with the Western Straits open to the ocean. Yep. Another one is Chile, South Africa, and the West Coast of Australia. So all of those are in a Western coastline. Wow, cool. Then there's the food forest piece. What are food forests? Dig into that a little bit. Sure. Food forests are productive systems that have more than one constituent plant group in them. An example I like to make is the difference between an orchard and a food forest would be the polycultural aspect of it. So adding a second and a third and perhaps a fourth and a fifth species into that area So that orchard of one stand of apples, let's say, becomes an interacting area of several species. Kind of like nature works, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's recreating a system that interacts the way that forest does or any natural space that you've probably gone for walks through. And you notice so many things going on and so many layers that it's not static and it's not one monoculture. So that's, in a nutshell, how I would start off explaining food for us. And I have another question for you, which is a favorite of mine for people that I know that dig into these topics, and that is when you've done a permaculture design course. Yes. When did you do it, and what is permaculture to you? Awesome. Well, you know, I was a little contrarian. For years, I was learning 
from internships directly with permaculture designers and farm managers and so forth who had all gone through the traditional path of permaculture design certificate, uh -huh. which is an intensive course to learn the ropes of how to sort of reformat your brain to design the way that nature does and less in a mainstream monocultural mindset. So it's kind of a reformatting of your brain. For me, I got the Bill Mollison Permaculture Design Handbook back in 2001 when I was doing an intensive permaculture apprenticeship at an organic farm called Finca Ipe in Costa Rica. Wow. So I had the book ever since 2001, but I didn't actually follow through to get my certificate until 2012. So there was an 11-year gap there where I was actively learning through apprenticeships and jobs involved with permaculture, but had not done the course itself, the permaculture design course. Uh -huh. But I was drawn to it more and more. I started out as a native plant restoration focus. Long story short, more and more people over the years have been asking for how to grow food and if I could help with that as a landscape designer. And so more and more I've been called toward, I would say. So in 2012, I took my permaculture design course at Quail Springs Permaculture in Santa Barbara County, California. And I specifically chose that spot because it's hyper arid. Uh, it's a part of California that's extremely dry. Yep. To answer your question about what I would call permaculture, permaculture is a design science process where you let the land tell you things and you try to integrate practices really from all over the indigenous world to try to come up with strategies to create local abundance. So we were talking a moment ago about food forests. That's a component of permaculture, although I think that permaculture can get applied to any natural science in the sense that you're looking for strategies to come up with local solutions. Perfect. So as you were sharing about this period of about 10 years before you took your permaculture design course, you were sharing about that. I had this thought that by the time you did your PDC, and for those of you that don't know what a PDC is, it's a permaculture design course. It's a 72-hour course that you do to get a certificate, which is a basic certificate in permaculture design. But by the time you made it to 2012, you almost could have been teaching the course, I would bet. Yeah, again, I was a bit contrarian. I wanted to go through the school hard knocks in a way. I wanted to dive in and put it in my bones. So I did several year-long farm internships where I was working either for free or for room and board or for a very low pay grade, depending on the internship. And I was learning how to effectively farm, how to use my body. An athlete, I was a former basketball player. I enjoy the ergonomics of working properly. Mm -hmm. By learning with farm managers and people in Central America who had done a lot in their bodies, I learned how to not only conceptually design systems and plan them out and schedule them and so forth, but also how to work without hurting myself and work in an efficient manner, which is a key component to switching from an enthusiast to a professional. Blessed to have mentors all throughout the way that taught me different components that kind of have amalgamated to make this design science that now I offer to people on a residential or community level. Each one gave me a piece of their expertise and I got to learn alongside of them by, by working at a low rate for a period of time to learn next to the mentors of how to do things. Perfect. So you are now in the business of creating these designs. Yeah, primarily residential, but also community-based systems. And really anywhere that the call is at, I'm interested in fostering, sort of like you were talking in your earlier at the podcast of the importance of seeds. And I see knowledge as a seed, as offering these design packages and consultations as a seed for community groups and clients to sort of inoculate themselves with new opportunities that they might have not considered that might be right under their nose or right off their property that's already sitting there waiting to happen. Right. So why did you choose landscape design as your venue for your contribution? That's a great question. You know, I started out in my mid-20s wanting to do something physical and wanting to make a decent pay at it, I would say. And after I got through some internships in my early 20s, that is, having spent the early 20s traveling a lot, interning a lot, working on my degree, coming in and out of college, and in my breaks, my years off, I wanted to work in something that I was passionate about that utilized my body and my natural abilities. Mm -hmm. So for a while, that was split between landscape maintenance and bartending at night. And pretty soon, I just found that my calling was a willingness to do the hard work if it meant that sort of autonomous freedom and natural living that I was after. So after a couple of years of that in my mid-20s, it was pretty obvious that even though bartending paid well, that I really enjoyed the landscaping, even though initially I was a grunt for other landscapers. 
just pulling weeds and moving wheelbarrows of mulch and soil and all the things that come with the toil of doing the labor end of things. You know, that's sort of paying your dues for now when I have the opportunity to mentor mid-20s assistants and younger people that are interested to be mentored. Sometimes you have to pay your dues on a, a hard day of work and you get a living wage, but you also get to observe site-specific elements. Each and every garden, each and every project has some new things that you're gleaning from being there as opposed to just wanting to read it in a book or read it in a blog and have it quick and clean. Mm -hmm. It's a little more amorphous with landscaping. I don't know exactly how I chose to go to landscaping. I think it was a natural fit for me to project manage and to have to be responsible for a holistic project each time. Here in the Bay Area, I work for a lot of professionals that are very busy, which isn't the ideal full picture of how I'd like to offer my services. But as a professional, it helps me have a good client base around the Bay Area who don't really know much about plants. And generally speaking, those that are urban professionals, homeowners here, almost by definition, don't have a background in agriculture. Right. There's been a niche for me to not only transform their spaces, but also sort of empower them and, and introduce them to what's around them. What kind of difference have you seen that your services and your talent has brought to some of these projects? It's been quite a journey. You know, at first I was really gung-ho about native restoration, Greg, and I was super hardcore about getting out the invasives and recreating what was here pre-colonial in a sense, quote unquote, even though I, I don't know if that's quite possible. So initially I was somewhat of a purist and really wanting to make an impact ecologically. And here in California, for example, we have a bounty of local food growing in within an hour or so of the Bay Area. And so there wasn't initially that impulse to grow a ton of food. The initial impulse was to take lawns or take water intensive gardens and turn them into drought tolerant habitat. But around the 2008 economic downturn, that's when I started to see a real market shift to lots of younger clients, young families, young first time homeowners, young enthusiasts who wanted to be taught DIY style, do it yourself, how to grow food. And so I started to be approached uh, more and more over the years by homeowners and community groups wanting to not only put the gardens in, but learn how to manage them. It's been a steady trend toward habitat drought tolerant with a few fruit trees plugged in to now anything on the spectrum between a drought tolerant native garden on the one end to a intense edible oasis on the other end. Nice. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Is there one job out there that you have done that absolutely transformed their yard, but also their lives that you were moved by? Yeah. The initial few years, I started diving in full-time with design business and consulting in 2007. And at first, again, I was focused on the non-edible drought-tolerant habitat components with concepts like year-round flowers, hands-off sort of drought-tolerant design that would be tough and bomb-proof from neglect, essentially. Right. I started to notice that clients who were not inclined to talk about plants were mentioning them more and more. And I started after, you know, I'd say five seasons of putting all these gardens in, started to realize, wow, there's this sort of healing component to these gardens. For example, yarrow, the ground cover manzanita, the kinnikinnick, lavender, some of these species that are not only habitat and drought tolerant and look beautiful, but they have an aromatic sort of healing quality to them. So initially I was pretty blown away that I was going back to return to these gardens to help manage them a couple of times a year and was noticing the speaking to the healing components are just at least feeling drawn out there and feeling good energy around their house. And that helped start to shift how I was looking at it, not just through the frontal lobe of, okay, this is a functional, mechanically sound garden design, but that there's all these hidden components that kind of start to emerge, that feels like there's these hidden benefits or these yields that start to show up a few years into these gardens after they are initially put in with a certain intent and then they evolve. That's kind of a chess match with nature, I'd say. You know, you put my intent out there and hope to have a high success rate, but then over the years it evolves and shifts and you kind of work with that to, to learn from it and help it thrive. I've been blessed now in the last few years to be much more established to where people seek me out to do edible food forest designs. And so that can be an amazing opportunity to see a state sort of overnight transformed from probably boxwoods and junipers and sort of ornamental placeholders or perhaps a lawn to multi-storied food forests and berry shrubs and all kind of bounties available as soon as they get rolling. And for me, it's been a lovely evolution to see that. If I had to pick one that really kind of blew my socks off, see the impact, it was last year, 2015, I was hired to run four rooftop gardens in San Francisco's downtown Tenderloin district. There were big residential buildings and each had rooftop gardens. And so that went from having a modest interaction with clientele 
throughout the Bay at a residential level to then being a placeholder for all these urban residents to come out to their garden spaces on the rooftops. So if I had to pick one, it would definitely be how much of an encounter I got blown away by doing that San Francisco job. Yeah. One of the things I noticed in your speaking is how you evolved through observation. So the basic tenet of permaculture is observation. We go out and observe. And it seems to me, as you were sharing, the more you observed, the more you were pushed to observe, and the more you noticed, then the more you observed. Is that the case? Absolutely. I think people romanticize the notion of being a farmer or a landscape designer as someone that's super in touch with plants, sort of a plant whisperer, which definitely comes with the territory, especially after a decade of on the ground work, et cetera. But I like to sort of jest with people and joke that, you know, you have to have the confidence to kill some plants to get started and you <laughs> yeah. get that experience. And you know, we all have those experiences, whether it's a raised bed in your patio or whether it's someone's small pot full of mint on their porch, you know, you kill plants and you're like, often if we don't make the jump of continuing to kill plants and jumping with that process, we can get discouraged by it. As a landscaper, you try to build off of what you hope will be solid. I would say my first season or two, I probably had a 75 to 80% success rate. And then now that's well up to, let's say, 95 to 99% success. And that's through failure. Right. So that's through planting 100 specimens and three of them crapping out. And then you're wondering what happened to those three. And you got to kind of go back and observe. You know, that can be a status quo decision to replace it with the exact same type of specimen. Or it can be an opportunity, and I would say the permaculture lens starts to train you in that sense to be like, well, okay, that, that didn't work there. This hedgerow did really well until it got under the pines, and then it didn't like the ones under the pines are stunted. So we could continue to put that species back in there and hope kind of blindly that it changes, or we could let that failure inform our next year's design plan and go with something else or do some research on what might like to grow underneath that type of pine, et cetera. That's the really fun part for me that I don't always initially explain very well to clients because they want a product, right? but that it is a design science that's evolving. And so when I get to go back and manage these gardens or help garden coach the client to manage them, I get to see those changes. Beautiful. So what are some urban strategies for producing abundance? That's a great question. You know, urban setting is becoming more and more the venue for a lot of positive change. I spent a decade in Humboldt County kind of retreated into the Redwoods and in a very liberal pocket of agricultural ruralness. And to come back down in 2007 and choose to engage with an urban environment is at first quite daunting and kind of challenging, but there's a lot of opportunity here. Number one, there's a lot of resources, a lot of human beings. So there's a lot of potential hands on deck. There's a lot of potential to do events. But as far as design science for urban settings, for me, several of my mentors were biointensive aficionados. And for those of the listeners who don't know what biointensive means, uh, it was brought over to America and popularized by a European designer named Alan Chadwick. And he started some gardens at UC Santa Cruz. And his gardens are legendary that he kind of etched them out of a dry hillside and turned it into this massive orchard polycultural haven. And then in the 60s and 70s and 80s, a lot of the West Coast permaculture authors and luminaries at this point, many of them went through that program at UC Santa Cruz and were influenced by Alan Chadwick. And then I was blessed to learn from some of those people. And so the biointensive method of planting and design is that you kind of strategically overplant with an understanding of the species you're working with. And that is a way that you can have plants crowd into a small square footage. And that's a bigger conversation, but part of that is to have their habits, their geometries of how they grow work together and to right. pick species that can live together without getting one another sick, but actually perhaps help each other grow better. Then there's an, a component of management so that if you have a bunch of arugula growing into one another, for example, you have a weekly harvest schedule to go and radially cut with scissors some of those leaves out to create mm -hmm. space again. So then you're letting more happen in a small space through the design plan of how you're managing that. So for me, biointense is a big one for the urban environment. You know, now having gardens all over the Bay that are decade old, uh, myself and my assistants get to benefit from going and doing management of cutting things back and pruning, but also harvesting a yield of cuttings. So with a lot of these gardens, not only they look beautiful and now they're established, but I like to think of them as mother plants that they can oh. then pr produce a bunch of propagated cuttings that go back to our home nurseries and become plant stock for future gardens. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, so that's a really exciting sort of thing that's emerged in the last couple of seasons was, wow, okay, we have all these repositories of cuttings and seed stock and so forth that we can start to propagate 
while we also get paid to visit and manage these places. Yes, that's sort of biointensive on a perennial system level. And then obviously the example I was making of the arugula is sort of a biointensive system on an annual vegetable level. Well, and in permaculture, we call that stacking functions, the process of putting those plants out there and then recollecting them. That, that definitely falls in stacking functions, does it not? Absolutely. Yeah. And having role players fulfill roles and then perhaps year three, year five of a garden, the other role players have established and gotten quite large and maybe you don't need some of those initial placeholders and you can relocate them through dividing them or planting them or digging them up or taking propagating cuttings off of them. So that's kind of a whole new era of these gardens now is to see them as these mother plant zones. Nice. So in your bio, you mentioned that you've worked with some renowned mentors. And that got my curiosity going. Tell me about them. Yeah, I feel really privileged to have some mentors in my path that have really opened up doorways for me of understanding and and opportunity. Started back in the mid-2000s, a local native plant mentor by the name of Stu Winchester here in Oakland, who teaches at the local community college, Merritt Community College, opened me up to a lot of opportunity of how to perceive the landscape and notice the nuances of it, not only the plants and what's growing in the local native spaces, but also how those species are interacting with the environment and the niches that they reside in. So that started to get me thinking in systems and and thinking about habitat as an organism that's in shift as opposed to a static thing. And that was in the early 2000s, got me really excited about native plant ecology and how to recreate guilds of plants that like to live with one another. Mm-hmm. Then around 2010, I started to really focus on seed saving and seeds and propagating seed. I actually met you, Greg, back in 2010 at the first seed school with Bill and Bill McDormand in Sedona. I remember. Yeah. And that really got me fired up about local seed libraries, local seed saving, and the opportunity to seed save as the sort of original currency. Then I followed that up with two winters in Baja, California, and Mexico with Gabriel Howard, who's another seed saver and seed luminary who had started uh, Seeds of Change way back in the day. Wow. And so went even deeper with seeds. And then, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I didn't take my permaculture design course till 2012 at Quail Springs in Santa Barbara, California. And there I was taught by a host of resident teachers at that permaculture center, the lead designer of which is Warren Brush, who's a fantastic teacher about dry land strategies. And then I say a really big one that sort of sparked me into my professional career of just going all in with permaculture was in 2013, I was part of the International Permaculture Convergence in Cuba. Oh, wow. Lo and behold, there was 400 of us from all around the world for two weeks in Cuba. First few days was lecture. The second few days was a mixer and and getting to know one another and presenting. And the third few days was farm tours. I was blessed that in that group of 400 permaculture designers from around the world, I was in a group of 80 Bay Area, Northern California people of which many, many authors, local teachers, were in that group, and I got to have an encounter on a regular basis, two of which that I would name are Christopher Shine, who teaches the local Merritt College Permaculture here in Oakland, and Cafe Fish, who teaches a permaculture course in Rough and Ready, California, called Practical Permaculture. And both of them not only said, when we get back to California, I'd like to have you start guest lecturing, Cafe in particular and Christopher, to some degree, really encouraged me to start submitting articles. And at that time, kind of piggybacks on the question you were asking earlier about why I was a landscaper, I was really pragmatically focused on my landscaping on a local level. And it was very daunting to consider that I would share those gifts and put it out there to strangers as a quote-unquote expert. Mm. It was that 2013 trip to Cuba where all these elders who said, basically, you know, you have a decade as a landscape designer and a landscaper. You're doing it. You need to start sharing it. And from that trip forward, I came back with a fire lit under my butt and I started submitting articles all over using the clippings that I would get from a local magazine to then submit to a regional magazine and et cetera, et cetera. So where now I'm blogging for Mother Earth News regularly, as well as writing article copy for the local Edible East Bay magazine. And then writing quarterly articles for Acres USA, which is a national agricultural journal. Yeah, congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. It's just been a process, but really it was the mentors reflecting to me that I was ready. I wouldn't have gone for that had I not been encouraged. One of my mentors, Larry Santoyo, taught me a long time ago that our job is to go out and do epic shit in the world. (laughs) 
So in my podcasts, I'm always looking for people that are doing epic. And that Cuba trip, when you shared about that Cuba trip and what it was, I got chills. That was epic. Congratulations on that. Epic. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I felt blessed. It was something I couldn't miss. And it lined up, the stars aligned for me to make the trip, you know, and I'm still receiving dividends from that. And, you know, that's what I recommend the listeners is following your path and your opportunity. The new doorway is open, but you sort of have to open, get things rolling, get that momentum, that inertia, yeah. and then sort of the next doorway start to open. You can't predict how it's going to evolve. Perfect. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. So I would say one place that I felt personally that I failed was when I became the urban agricultural supervisor for this nonprofit in San Francisco in 2015. I had the daunting challenge of running an on-the-ground organic farm right in the Civic Center Plaza of San Francisco, which today you can still find at the corner of McAllister and Larkin. Wow. And four rooftop gardens for large, high-rise, low-income housing. They were understaffed, undermanned, and underbudgeted which is somewhat standard, it seems, often Mm -hmm. with some of these endeavors. But I was offered a salary to full-time run this program. So I made the big decision to moonlight my Native Sun Gardens design business to the weekends and the evenings and to run these five garden locations full-time. I saw the potential, and I was able to directly distribute the weekly food to the residents. And so on that level, it was a huge success. We produced over 4,400 pounds of rooftop vegetable pounds that year. Wow. It was a big success, and I was able to integrate lots of efficiency increases by introducing permaculture principles. Like we were talking about earlier, biointensive and polycultural planting. Those were three simple ways I was able to increase the raised beds productivity. You know, and my vision was to train the next generation and the next replacers of me to be having legacy and to have success with the program. So Long story short, the failure for me was that there was not as much of an educational training component to the work the way it was incarnate. Out of each building that would have over 100 residents, if I was able to get one or two to regularly come and contribute their time and energy, that was considered a success. So on the level of producing rooftop food in the middle of the city, it was an amazing example. I have lots of documentation and statistics and photographs from that period. But for me personally, seeing the potential of these huge havens on the rooftops for these massive buildings, it felt like a bit of a failure that I wasn't able to influence more people to use their opposable thumbs and get involved. (laughs) So what would you do differently? Well, I probably would have taken the job with one of two ways. The more proactive way would have been to say, look, this is what I need to incorporate into the game plan that may not currently be intended to have a training component so that you can understand that there's an important cultural aspect to the food production, that it's not just a market garden that's producing X amount of value, but it's also, I see each garden as a living lab and as a learning lab where you can train and hold events and teach people. And I know that you've been big with that with your urban farm estate throughout the years. So that's probably how I would have done it. Or I would have done it as a large scale permaculture design and offered it as sort of a flat rate to inoculate a bunch of design methodologies and not expected it to be on the ground changing just because I was there. That's the reality of the situation. When you're working with a larger bureaucracy, you have to have the expectations laid out from the gate or expect it to be what it is and take positives away from your time there that you can't. Yeah, exactly. In that sense, it was a success. Well, so, and that's my next question is what do you consider your biggest success? Well, aside from having an 18-month-old boy, which I'm really proud of, he's doing great. Besides that, I would say my biggest success is intuiting at a young age that I wanted to work with plants and pursuing that path throughout all of my internships and apprenticeships and the different rungs of understanding that I went through to get to the 37-year-old now. I'm grateful that I stayed the path and that I paid my dues in my 20s while I was still young to learn a lot of technique and to integrate them into a unique design science Even here in the Bay Area being a very progressive area, it's not quite too often that the food growing communities and the ecology restoration habitat communities come together. And I see permaculture as being that bridge. Yeah. And I see Native Sun Gardens, my design business, as being that niche. And I think that's what makes me a unique design service is that I'm willing to integrate drought tolerant habitat with food production and create unique microclimate specific gardens. To answer your question, the big success has been to start out in 2007, I've been designing them to be that, so that now a decade later, I have all these gardens all around the Bay who are doing quite well with very minimal labor. 
Many mm-hmm. of them are on drip irrigation and only get professional care two to four times a year. So I consider that a success. Perfect. And what drives you? What drives me is awakening in people their potential. Lately, I've been playing with this idea of 100 square feet per day model idea of like just some conceptual bite off that we could get culturally back into a rhythm of obviously no one's going to do it every single day. But if you plowed and planted a 10 by 10 area each day as a human, wow, the effect cumulatively would be ginormous. Even if we just had a day, like let's say it was on Earth Day that each year, we each picked a 10 by 10 area and planted it with fava beans or whatever it is. That cumulative effect is massive. And I think personally that we have these thumbs because we are the stewards of the planet. And so we have a unique role as human animals to be the stewards. We don't have to fix it. We don't have to change it, but we can foster it and steer it and steward it. You know, that personal journey of getting past thinking that nature is perfect the way it is or that farm fields are super intensive and there's no in between. I think that food forests and permaculture are ways to integrate those two extremes and to learn how to live in rhythm with them is sort of our task. So that's what motivates me is to get into rhythm with that and to encourage others to learn how to get into that rhythm. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? Well, if I had to recommend one book, it would be The Permaculture Design Handbook by Bill Mollison, which was put out quite a long time ago for its amazing instructional drawings and depictions. I'm a visual learner as opposed to a frontal lobe learner, so visuals help me tremendously. Oh, yeah. If I had to pick one book, it would be that. But I would say... For some of your listeners that are interested in hot books coming out now, I've been blessed to be now the book reviewer for Acres USA, and so they send me free permaculture books. So I'm really excited about that. How cool is that? Yeah, I get to read the newest books, and they taught me the books to review them. So there's a book out by New Society Press called The Food Forest Handbook by Daryl Frey and Michelle Solva. It just came out in the last year, I believe. Let me look at here. Yes, the 2017. So it's just fresh out in the press. Food Forest Handbook, Design and Manage a Home-Scale Perennial Polyculture Garden. Again, by Daniel Frey and Michelle Solva. That's F-R-E-Y and Solva is C-Z-O-L-B-A. I hope I'm saying that right. Perfect. What's great about that, it's super visual and it's super plant-based. So there's all these lists of plants that love to live together, et cetera. And so for those of you listeners who want to increase your your plant knowledge, this is a really cool book. Perfect. And what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Wow. My advice is if you are conceptually considering jumping into a plant-based income stream or livelihood or lifestyle is to work with your mentors to find those who are doing it and offer your services. Once that's happened and you have it in your bones and you're feeling confident to do it, is to go for it, but to continue to work in your hands, not making it just a conceptual design idea, but to farm a piece of land or to prune trees or to seed out wildflowers or continue to do something that's in the ground. Yeah, I'd say that's my advice is to find those who are doing it and then to continue to physically do it as a way to to root your work through the years. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for all the work you do. And thanks for joining us on the show today, Joshua. Thank you so much, Greg. I'm, I'm grateful to be on, the, on this podcast. I appreciate you reaching out. You bet. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? A couple of different ways. My main design website is www.nativesungardens.com. That's N-A-T-I-V-E-S-U-N-G-A-R-D-E-N-S.com. You can get some of my photo ideas rolling as well as some resources on there for links and cool ideas. If you'd like to see my portfolio of a lot of different finished gardens and see ideas of of them. You can also go to house.com, which is H-O-U-Z-Z.com and search Native Sun Gardens. And then in the social media world on Twitter, I'm at Native Sun Garden with no S. So at N-A-T-I-V-E-S-U-N-G-A-R-D-E-N. And on YouTube, I am my name, Joshua Thayer. I have a YouTube station getting rolling. My name is Joshua, J-O-S-H-U-A-B-U-R-M-A-N-T-H-A-Y-E-R, Joshua Berman Thayer. And you can Google me and I have lots of articles on the interweb that you can find and hopefully learn from and share that knowledge. So absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash native sun gardens. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the urban farm podcast. You can also visit urbanfarm.org to find more articles, podcasts, and webinars as we strive to be your urban farming resource.
Growing plants that thrive in your yard is a lot easier than you think. It starts with saving your own seeds and letting them remember what they already learned. Just text SEEDS to 33444 or visit IWANTTOSAVESEEDS.COM and you'll receive our free webinar about why seeds matter, why saving them is easy, and how you can save your own. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.